I'm a little nervous, just partly for the fact that um, I'm going to talk about science in a room with scientists. <laughs> so if I get anything like really wrong, please be gentle <laughs> because I'm a non-expert. So, okay. All right. Um, so my title is this, not natural, not a mystic, um, a kind of an allusion to the Bob Marley song, A Natural Mystic. Um, I really like that song. I've got nothing against Bob Marley. I you know, think it's a great song, um, but it, it's kind of relevant to what I want to talk about, which is um, thinking about biological relations as things that are constantly being worked out. Um, uh, that, so that's kind of partly the not natural bit, um, and that's something that I elaborate on, on in an essay that um, has just been published on the Sydney Review of Books. So um, uh, that's kind of more the not natural part. The not, mystic, not a mystic part is talking about some recent um, studies that have been done with psychedelics um, in, in, in the States, particularly at Johns, Johns Hopkins University in the States, where they've been looking at um, how high doses of uh, psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, uh, can trigger what they're calling a mystical experience. And I want to think about that in slightly different terms to the mystical terms that they're describing. So I'll come to that towards the end. But first, I want to uh, address the subtitle, which is um, thinking about chemical language and relational becoming and thinking about how things are connected, how, how, how organisms are uh, are connected through molecules, basically. So let's let's have it. These are some ideas. Okay, sensing is mostly chemical. Um, the the idea with this is that if you look at it at a cell on a on a cellular level, that most of the sensing that's going on is actually through molecules and and chemicals. So therefore, um, maybe communication is mostly molecular. Um, uh, and I guess as as humans. Um, we, we tend to think about, uh, you know, particular forms of communication and particular forms of sensing that we're habituated to. So if we kind of step outside our human frame, I think we can, you know, maybe imagine that there are all these other forms of communication and sensing going on in the natural world. Um, so, and, and molecular communication or sensing is uh, important to a whole bunch of things. Um, collective action in, in bacteria, um, quorum sensing, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, the formation of the eukaryotic cell, so the merging of these two species of bacteria that went into creating the eukaryotic cell, um, the emergence of multicellularity, this is something else that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about with um, Donna, uh, with sorry, Nicole King's work um, at, uh, with coenoflagellates, so that there's really important chemical sensing going on in the creation of a multicellular creature, right? In a, in a cell, in a creature that has more than one cell, and of course, symbiotic relationships. Um, and then uh, extending on to that to our health and well-being, and, and uh, Jane mentioned the microbiome, and this is something that has become a big uh, area of interest for a lot of people is how we relate to microbes through our microbiome and how other species relate to, to microbes through their, their microbiome. So um, the sensing underlying molecular communication, you know, this is like a really cartoon version of, of it as I understand it, which is that you have molecules that um, are often produced by cells um, of various kinds. You have receptors that are, are, are tuned to these molecules and then those receptors will do something. Okay, and I'm going to elaborate on, on that, that cartoon version. So um, chemical language is ubiquitous from bacteria, quorum sensing to um, our brains. Um, and I want to think about psychedelics and neurotransmitters in those terms. Um, uh, chemical language facilitates collective action within a species, bacterial quorum sensing, and across species, um, symbiosis and symbiogenesis. So uh, the first, the first uh, scientist I wanna, whose work I want to look at is Bonnie Bassler. Bonnie Bassler studies um, quorum sensing in bacteria, and I'm going to explain more about that in a moment. Um, it's worth, this is, she's kind of a bit of a superstar of science communication. She had, this is, this is an image from her TED talk, 
um, which has you know a million views or whatever. Um, and so, but she has a bunch of other lectures on on YouTube, which are all really great. And she is like a really uh, amazing communicator of this stuff. So if you're if you feel like my quick gloss of this material is um, is 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 not the not the best, then go and seek out her videos because she'll explain it much better than I do. Um, so the first, the first thing that I, I wanted to touch on is this, this iconic example of symbiosis. It's a symbiosis between the Hawaiian bobtail squid and um, Vibrio fisheri, which is a bioluminescent bacteria. This squid has a, has a, a light organ that produces, um, uh, that produces light and acts as a kind of counter illumination strategy to uh, protect it from predators. So uh, there's, a, there's a really intricate kind of molecular signaling that goes on between the bacteria and the squid in order to facilitate this, this, um, this symbiosis, this kind of back and forth conversation where the, where the squid is kind of uh, you know, asking the bacteria if you're really the, the guy who I wanna have in my light organ because there's only one bacteria in the light organ. So there's this constant kind of dialogue back and forth until the, the, the right bacteria colonizes the squid and, and allows for this um, uh, symbiosis. So this is the bacteria that, that is uh, in the light organ. Um, well, it's not, it's, it's actually just a kind of cartoon sketch, but uh, this is uh, Vibrio fisheri. And, and this explains, this, this slide is, is an attempt that, that I've stolen from uh, Bonnie Bassler, that is, is uh, a kind of explanation of how quorum sensing works. So what you have on the left-hand side of the slide is, um, is, is a molecule that's being produced by the cell that's, that's being pumped out into its surroundings. And, and then that molecule diffuses back inside the cell and is picked up by Luxar, which is the receptor. And when that molecule reaches a certain threshold, the, it turns on the action. So this is the thing, we've got the, we've got the molecule, We've got the receptor and then we've got the action. And in this case, the action is making light, turning on light. Um, so, so what this basically allows the bacteria to do is to see, see how many of its fellow, uh, how many of its kind are surrounding it. And when, when it knows that there's plenty of, plenty of its kind around, it will turn on the light and it will produce this um, bioluminescence. Um, so here's, here's going back to that idea of, of molecule a receptor action. In this case, it's gene expression. It's turning on a bunch of genes that make light. Um, so, uh, so this is one of a whole range, and, and all of these slides are stolen from Bonnie Blasler. This is one of a whole range of uh, molecules that different um, bacteria produce that allow them to sense their own kind, and that is the intraspecies communication. So there's this whole range of molecules, and here's another bioluminescent bacteria that um, that does does uh, the same thing basically as um, as Vibrio fisheri. It's a, another Vibrio Vibrio harvii, and it's and that photo is taken just with the light of the bacteria in in a flask. So there's uh, plenty of bacteria in there, and they've all realised that there's plenty around, and so they're making light. Um, so just a quick thing on on different types of receptors here. There's here there's two two different types, uh, two main classes of bacteria. The gram-positive and the gram-negative bacteria. And the gram-positive bacteria have a receptor on the outside of their cells, and the gram-negative bacteria, like Vibrio fisheri, have the receptor on the inside of the cell. So that means that the molecules actually have to come into the cell before, before they can do their thing. Um, in both cases, that it, these molecules are turning on a kind of group behavior, um, and uh, um, this is, there, are, there are other molecules that all bacteria produce and that, that uh, all can also uh, turn on ki different kinds of group behaviour. So it's a way of sensing who else is around as well. So, so, so bacteria are picking up on the, the molecules that they produce, but they're also picking up on the molecules that, that other um, bacteria produce. So. Um, the general point that I want to take out of this, this idea of, of, of bacteria and quorum sensing is that the, the molecular language of bacteria allows for this kind of collective action. It's what allows for the, the, the group of cells to act as a collective, right? Without molecular language, there's no, there's no kind of collective action. So, and this is, this is the kind of theme that I want to uh, touch on in, in relation to another a bunch of examples. And, and it also allows for, for, for that, that, those kinds of symbiosis that we see in, in the Hawaiian bobtail squid. 
Okay, the second example I want to touch on is the work of Nicole King. Um, uh, she's a biologist who studies this coanoflagellate, which is a single cell organism that also has a multicellular form. And, and they're, they're eukaryotes, so they're, they're not bacteria, they're, they're eukaryotes. And they're actually the, the she describes them as our, our um, the, 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 uh, the last common ancestor of animals, in the, sorry, the, the, the ancestor of animals that leads to multicellular uh, animals. So in, in those kind of phylogenetic trees, they're kind of at the base of, of, of those. So this is, this is an image um, from, an, from a talk. If you want to find the talk, it's on YouTube as well, Bacteria as Master Regulators and Aphrodisiacs. Um, and these are the coanoflagellates in their multicellular form. They make these little, little multicellular rosettes, uh, hence the name S. rosetta. Okay, and this, this, is, this is basically what, what um, Nicole King's lab is trying to figure out, is how do you go from a single cell to a multicellular rosette? And so what triggers that process? Because these, you know, these are bacteria, that, these are, sorry, uh, 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 eukaryotic microbes that have these two, two, two ways of being in the world. And she wants to know what triggers the multicellular form. So she's um, done a whole lot of experiments and worked out that there's this particular bacteria called Algorophagus, which produces a bunch of molecules that take the single cell and, and trigger a kind of multicellular form of of um, of S rosetta. Um, so, and just one other thing on this slide um, is that that the bacteria that triggers this multicellular form is related to a lot of the bacteria that we have in our guts. So, and that's kind of important because it gives us a sense that some of these molecules that are that are that are important in this case in the development of multicellularity are also may also be important to to the way that we communicate with bacteria in our in our guts. Um, so she did a, a whole stack of exper experiments to find this, these two molecules that are enough to trigger um, the, the, the multicellular forms. Um, so basically taking different parts of the bacteria and, and, turn, and, and fractionating them out into different molecules so that she can find the molecules that trigger uh, multicellularity. And importantly, in this case, there's actually three really important molecules. It's not a single molecule. There's three important molecules that actually make this, this microbe go from a single cell form to a multicellular form. And it's a kind of synergistic relationship between these three um, molecules that do that. So this is um, going to uh, the, uh, the, the relationship of these, these bacteria to, yeah, I'm, maybe there's a lot on this slide, I realize, but, but, but you don't have to understand it. Because uh, um, basically the, 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 the important thing here is just the, the point that I made earlier is that these, these are molecules that are, that are very similar to molecules that are, pro are produced by a really important bacteria that's in our intestine called Acomancia. Um, and this is a bacteria that lines our intestine and actually lives on, on um, mucus, on the mucus linings of our intestine. So there's the implication that maybe the, the same molecules that are triggering um, multicellularity also have a really important role in, in, in perhaps, this is still speculation, but perhaps they have an important role in, in, the, in our relationship with our intestinal um, microbiome. So, um, those are, these are the molecules and, and it kind of comes back to this point of, of thinking about how there's, how there's certain molecular material, how there's certain chemicals that can trigger uh, uh, in, uh, interconnectedness, that can trigger the emergence of larger bodies from, from in this case, um, in, in relation to multicellularity. So, um, and in the case of, in the case of coenoflagellates, it's a little bit un uncertain as to what the receptors are for these molecules, but there's something in there. Uh, so you've got a bunch of molecules, you've got a, uncertain receptors, and then we've got multicellularity being produced. Now, there's one other cool thing about these coenoflagellates, and that relates to it, precisely the bacteria that produces light um, in the Hawaiian bobtail squid. This, um, this, this, this bacteria also produces a kind of aphrodisiac for the, um, for, for the coanoflagellates. And this, this aphrodisiac actually um, means, allows those, oh, sorry, in the previous slide, 
what you're seeing in those, in those purple images there is actually the fusion of these cells. Um, so there's a particular mole molecule that's produced that allows for sex to happen basically between these um, coanoflagellates. And that's a molecule that's produced by, um, by, the, by the Vibrio. And, and actually it's very, very similar to molecules that allow for the fusion of the egg and sperm in humans. So once again, we have this kind of, um, these, these molecules that, as with the gut bacteria, that, that may play a role in coanoflagellates and in humans. So we're starting to see that maybe there's, in, in these relations, that, that there may be some common threads between the roles of certain molecules um, you know, at, at a smaller scale, and then once we, we look at the human body. Okay, so those are the main things that I want to cover in relation to uh, thinking about thinking about the, the, the biology of the microbes. Now I want to skip over to thinking about the way that molecules affect us and, um, and think about uh, these signaling molecules, right? These are signaling molecules that are important to animals. Um, tryptamine, serotonin, neurotransmitters, um, and then a whole lot of related molecules, and you can see by their shape that they're related, that are psychoactive. So that bind to some of the same receptors as as the as serotonin. So in fact, the the, the receptors that these psychoactive substances are named for are uh, they're named uh, their serotonin receptors, and um, this is the main one. It's the 5-HT2A receptor. This is the one that all of the classic psychedelic bind to. So LSD, uh, psilocybin, DMT, uh, mescaline, they all bind to this receptor. And these are receptors that are found in the brain and in the gut. Um, so, so uh, and, and particular parts of the brain that are, I think are important to the, the action of, of, of psychedelics and the kinds of experiences that uh, we might have with psychedelics. So one of the things that, that has just recently come out that, that, that these substances appear to be doing, and this is related to, this is, this is work that they've done looking at LSD and psilocybin, and that, that is that the, these molecules, in this case psilocybin, um, is binding to this receptor, and one of the actions that, is, that it's producing is actually neurogenesis. It's actually driving the development of, and, and the growth of, of neurons. Um, this is in, in, in fruit flies and in mice, and obviously there's questions as to whether the same thing is happening in, in humans, but it would, it would, it would actually uh, provide an explanation for, for some of the effects of these substances in humans. So the next thing that I want to touch on is, is this, this work that's been done at John, John Hopkins um, in relation to the mystical experience. Um, so this is, this is now getting a little bit more uh, outside of the purely materialistic approach, and, and now we're thinking about the subjective experience. Okay, so we have a molecule, we have a receptor, and according to John Hopkins, in 58% in, uh, in of cases, we have a mystical experience at a certain dosage of, 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 um, of psilocybin. Okay, so this is, a, this is a study that was conducted in 2006, giving, giving psilocybin, the active ingredient in, in magic mushrooms, to healthy uh, volunteers, 36 par participants um, had a high dose of, of psilocybin. So, and dose is obviously really important because you can take these substances at a low dose and have zero perceptual effects. Um, but once they cross a certain threshold, and this kind of maybe goes back to what we're thinking about with the bacteria and the quorum sensing, once these molecules cross a certain threshold in the brain, then they can take you to all sorts of places that might lead to these kinds of mystical experiences that, that they're describing in the, in the John Hopkins study. So um, this is, this is the, these are the key criteria of the mystical experience as defined by uh, three dudes, basically. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you who those dudes are in a moment. But yeah, that's, that, that's, that, these, these are the key categories. Feelings of unity and interconnectedness with all people and things, a sense of sacredness, feelings of peace and joy, a sense of transcending normal time and space, ineffability, meaning that these experiences are really hard to describe in words, um, and an intuitive belief that the experience is a source of objective truth about the nature of reality. 
These are the criteria that they're using and they have uh, uh, a questionnaire that basically uh, addresses these criteria and they get people to fill out this questionnaire and give a score from uh, zero to, to five, I think it is, um, in relation to a bunch of questions that address this criteria. Um, so the, the, this, is, this is to come back to this question of where these where this definition comes from. This definition comes from, um, firstly, William James' book, the, vari the Varieties of Religious Experience. Okay, he's the first one who kind of, you know, tries to create some kind of systematic definition of, of what the mystical experience might be. Then it's elaborated on by uh, Walter Terence Stace in Mysticism and Philosophy and uh, Ralph W. Hood in, um, in a book, uh, a variety of, uh, sorry, Mysticism, a variety of psychological perspectives. So we've got three Anglo-Americans who um, through their study of philosophy and religion on, the, on, a, on an exclusively east-west axis, it should be said, that they come up with this, this definition of the, of the mystical experience. And you know, uh, going, uh, going back to William James, the varieties of religious experience is basically a, a work in, you know, he, uh, in the field that he kind of helped to found of comparative religion which is com comparing mystical experiences along that east-west axis, so thinking about Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Islam, and Christianity, uh, Judaism. Um, he doesn't go outside, really, of that in, in, in thinking about the mystical experience. Um, so um, this is, this is a, a, okay, this is, a, a, I have to put up some of my Photoshop work here. <laughs> so, um, this is actually not Michael Pollan in the foreground, but that's him in the background there. And this is this is a quote from a talk that 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 he gave. He's written a book on psychedelics, which I can highly recommend. It's just recently come out, um, where he where he covers a lot of the recent science um, around psychedelics, and um, and and uh, you know I think that gives a really interesting take on on the subjects. In this talk, he said that that the relationship of psychedelics to Eastern mysticism was in large part an accident of history. And I think he's right on that. I think um, that 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 we, from from this quote from William James, um, which is kind of the obligatory quote, if you're going to give a talk about psychedelics, you ha almost have to include this quote, and you're going to talk about William James. Our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, while all about it parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. We may go through life without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus and at a touch they are there in all their completeness. Definite types of mentality which probably somewhere have their field of application and adaption. No account of the universe in its totality can be final which leave these, these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. And so, you know, this is this is this is part of the argument that um, uh, that William James, and I think, kind of a key moment in the argument that William James is making in the varieties of religious experience that, myst that the mystical experience is really fundamental to to our, 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 our humanness, you know, and that in some ways, um, it you, you, we 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 need to be able to think about it, um, and and that knowledge that excludes it um, is is incomplete. Um, and this is uh, Aldous Huxley. Um, in 1962, 60 years later, whereas the ordinary everyday experience is of course absolutely essential, most of the time it's not the only possible experience. There are other types of consciousness, I mean the artist type, the mystics type and so on, which have empirically an enormous value and which may help people to live less self-centered and more charitable lives. So you can hear the echoes of William James in Huxley's words. And I think, you know, from, from, from William James to Huxley, to Timothy Leary, to a, a bunch of really key figures in the counterculture in the States, what you see is this really strong connection between East and West. Um, in, uh, and and to, to actually ignore, uh, you know, a whole lot of other stuff, I think, which, which I think is important. So, um, and, and it's just to reiterate this point before I touch briefly on some of the other stuff that I think is important if we, you know, we're to get outside of just this east-west axis. So, um, obviously, this, the subjective experience of psychedelics depends on, on these things. On set, that is the experience, what, how you feel when you come to the experience, the setting where you're taking it. So, uh, you know, some of the early experiments they did with psychedelics, they did in bare in bare rooms in hospitals and people had a horrible time because they were, you know, under fluorescent lights. 
the, new, the, the latest round of experiments are in very comfortable living room spaces and are very carefully guided. Um, so suggestion, you know, what, who, who is, who, what kinds of thing, what kinds of, the, 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 the suggestions about what kinds of experiences you might have are really important to the kinds of experiences that you have. There's this kind of feedback loop in terms of like the meanings that we associate with these things. And discipline and dosage. So, and I'll talk about discipline in a moment. Um, so the, the emphasis in, in, the, in defining the mystical experience on experiences of unity and oneness, I'm arguing are really a product of this east-west axis. And so the question then is what's missing? Um, one thing that's missing is the knowledge of, of a, a lot of pre-Columbian um, uh, cultures, particularly in the Americas, who, who you have used psychedelics for thousands of years. And their practices really don't talk about oneness and unity. They talk about other kinds of things. Um, so one example of that is the practice of, of drinking ayahuasca in the Amazon. Ayahuasca is a psychedelic beverage that contains DMT. Um, and so, so one of the one of the practices that 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 they do in the Amazon is to eat a really restricted diet um, of just uh, maybe bananas and rice and potatoes, and then ingest um, medicinal plants and and uh, ayahuasca once a week. Right. So the idea is that you create a very neutral environment in the body and then you ingest these molecules and you really study what they do to your body. And um, and so the the use of the psychedelic in that case is about how can it facilitate relation, your relationship to these other plants, to these other uh, plants that may help you to heal. And, and, and so this is a kind of medicinal uh, practice. Um, and, and so that's one example, I think, of something that's very different to this idea of unity and, and interconnectedness, where you have a, a practice around psychedelics that's really based on, on relationship. So we might also have this kind of profound experience of, of manyness rather than of unity, of like many, many things happening. And with that in mind, I, I will end now just with a brief quote from this book um, by the author Cesar Calvo, who, who's, um, who is a Peruvian author who's, who's written about, um, in this novel, it's about uh, a, a bunch of um, curanderos, witch doctors in the Amazon who are working with ayahuasca. And this is, this is a quote where, where the, the key figure in the novel is speaking, Eno Moxo. So this is from the three halves of Eno Moxo. <clears throat> if I were to tell you everything you wouldn't believe it. You can never believe everything, you know. You can never ever hear everything. Think about the jungle. If you really listen to the sounds of the jungle, what do you hear? Not only do you hear, do you hear the howls of the monkeys, not only the buzz of mosquitoes, of the arambasa, the fiercest and darkest bee, of the chinchilejo that you no doubt call dragonfly, of the chuspi, which infects you as it bites, of the chara, chara, cara, of the cara chapuxa, which bleeds without warning. Not only do you hear the ron, ronsapa hissing in the wind and the white cloak which drinks your hair and the kiyu wasp of yellow flights and the papasi, which is born from worms but is not a worm and the wairing, wairanga, which never touches the ground. Not only do you hear the flute bird which can't fly and has wings, nor the Ashun. Okay, so this is the beginning of um, a long list of about 187 plants and animals. And, and it goes over, um, you know, some, of the, you know, some of these plants and animals uh, might kill you, and there's descriptions of how they can kill you. Um, some of them might heal, there's descriptions of how they can heal. Um, and then there's also uh, an ancestral fish spirits that sing prophetic songs. Uh, the plants, animals, spirits, and their songs are all part of a, a cacophony of the jungle night. The list and the snippets of information about these species runs for five pages. Then we have um, this passage. And more than anything, you hear the footsteps of the animals that you have been before becoming human. The steps of stones and plants and things that every human has been. You also hear what you've heard before. All of this resonates in the jungle night. Truthful stories, stories of tomorrow. Everything that you will hear, all of it resonates in anticipation in the middle of the jungle night, in the jungle that resonates in the middle of the night. Memory is much more, you know. True memory holds what is to come, what will never come, 
Imagine, just imagine, who is going to be able to hear all of that all at once and believe it? So I wanted to um, finish with this passage because I think um, it kind of inverts some of the ideas about some of our key ideas in, 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 in Western epistemologies that, that um, seeing is believing. In this case, hearing is disbelieving. And I think, I think what, what's been referred to in this passage is that, that if you really listen, if you really listen to all of the sounds, all of the forms of molecular communication, it's beyond our ability to comprehend and perhaps believe. So I'll, I'll end there. <laughs>